Merry Christmas, you filthy animals, and welcome to the final cinematic excrement of 2022. Today, as promised, I am going to take a look at the other Christmas movie that was nominated for Worst Picture by the Razzies, A Medea Christmas. It is my first official foray into the world of Tyler Perry, specifically with his most well-known creation, Mabel Earlene Simmons, better known as Medea. The character was initially created for the stage way back in 1999 with the play I Can Do Bad All By Myself and later brought to the big screen in 2005 with Diary of a Mad Black Woman. She's a loud, profane, gun-toting, weed-smoking, street-smart granny who ain't afraid to tell it like it is. You know it's funny how you never hear that phrase used to describe someone nice? You never hear somebody say, you know, that shirt looks really good on you. Hey, I'm just telling it like it is. The character's name comes from a southern colloquialism for Mother Dearest and is a tribute to Perry's mother and aunt, the type of person who, according to Perry, would beat the hell out of you, then turn around and offer you a ride to the hospital. Charming. The character has gone on to appear in 11 plays and 11 movies, technically 12 movies if you count her cameo in Meet the Browns. The movies have never exactly been critical darlings, but thanks to the character's fan base and the relatively low budgets, they are usually quite profitable. Not always, but we'll get to that. And for better or worse, the character continues to be a huge part of popular culture to this day. Though even among the African American community, opinions on Medea are not always positive. Spike Lee, in particular, has said the character is a form of minstrelsy and reinforces negative stereotypes about black people, and has referred to Perry's work as coonery buffoonery. His words, not mine, just, just so we're clear. I have not gone through Medea's entire filmography because who has time for that? Ain't nobody got time for that! You tell him, Sweet Brown. You know she has a cameo in a Medea Christmas? So does Antoine Dodson. I'm not sure why, but I guess they got a paycheck out of it, so good for them. But anyway, I have at least seen the stage version of I Can Do Bad, and I don't know if I'm the right person to say if Spike Lee's assessment of Medea is correct. You know, because... But personally, the only joke I find offensive is one that is not funny. And that's why I find Medea very offensive. I know comedy is subjective, and if the character does something for you, great. I get it. But I don't get it. I don't find Medea to be all that funny. Well, except for this bit. The Bible says women ain't supposed to make no coffin. What does it say? The Bible says Hebrews. <laughs> it's such a stupid pun, I know, but sue me, I love it. But overall, the character does nothing for me. When I look at Medea, I mainly see a pretty horrible person who waves a gun around and talks weird. Or should I say, Turk's word. All right, I have him to call you here when he come in the door. You know, Spike may have a point. The play also thumps that Bible and thumps it good and hard, and considering Perry's target audience, it comes across to me as preaching to the choir. And the dialogue is janky as hell. The vast majority of these conversations do not sound natural at all. About the only character that does sound remotely natural is, oddly enough, Medea. And that's because Perry rarely sticks to the script. He's very big on ad-libbing and encourages his castmates to do likewise. And I wish the rest of the cast could improv as well as he. Then they might sound like real people instead of caricatures. I mean, as long as they're speaking like real people and not like... All right, I'll have him to call you here when he come in the door. I've also seen the movie Diary of a Mad Black Woman, based on the play of the same name, and it's... not terrible, actually. Yeah, I'm as surprised as you, but I honestly don't hate it. It's not all that great either, but it's miles ahead of I Can Do Bad. Part of that is probably due to the fact that Medea is not the central character, as some of the posters might lead you to believe. In Diary, Medea is a garnish, which is great. I can handle Medea in small doses. The titular mad black woman is Helen, played by Kimberly Elise, who has been thrown out by her unfaithful, ungrateful bastard of a husband Charles, and Medea takes her in. She then starts a romance with a man named Orlando, who is a much better human being than Charles, and she starts to feel much better about herself. The movie is not without its problems. There's still some Bible thumping, though it's not nearly as heavy-handed as I can do bad. And Perry's attitudes towards men's and women's roles in relationships are a bit outdated, even for 2005. But his writing had noticeably improved by this point, and it does have a good message about forgiveness. The movie also corrects what I consider to be a huge misstep in the play. In both versions of the story, Charles ends up paralyzed, although the circumstances are different, and after initially reveling in Charles' suffering, Helen takes it upon herself to nurse him back to health and the two make peace. Where the stories differ is in the play, Helen breaks it off with Orlando to go back to Charles. What? The actual fu- 
By the time he made the movie, someone must have knocked some sense into Perry and he changed the ending so she ends up with Orlando. You know, the man who did not treat her like shit. Helen and Charles still make peace, but she realizes that while she can forgive, she cannot forget. It's a much better ending compared to the play, which was just insulting. Anyway, eight years and seven movies later, Tyler Perry decided to take a stab at the world of holiday hijinks with A Medea Christmas, once again reprising his role as the title character, as well as writing, directing, and producing. The movie is not based on the play of the same name. Apart from the presence of Medea and the title, the two do not share much. The movie introduces us to Medea's great-niece Eileen, played by Anna Maria Horsford, who, against anything that could be remotely considered better judgment, decides to get Medea a job at her department store. This has predictable results, as Medea spends her time either ignoring or outright insulting the customers, and she doesn't even last half the day before management gives her the boot. And all of this would be fine if she was actually funny, but oh lord, she's not. Medea just comes across as arrogant and abusive. This was pretty much the only line that got a chuckle out of me. I ain't taking my medicine this morning. What medicine? Five milligrams of don't choke that hoe. I think you can get that over the counter now. Anyway, Eileen's daughter Lacey, played by Tika Sumter, works as an elementary school teacher in the fictional farming town of Lickspittle, Alabama. Wait, no, that's not right. What's it called? Buck Tussle. Yeah, like that's better. She has a master's degree and could have gone anywhere in the country with the credentials she has. I know this because the school principal spells it out for us. And I know you could have gone anywhere in the country with the credentials you have. Thank you, Principal Exposition. Remember how I said Tyler's writing had improved with Diary? He seems to have regressed a bit. Or he just got lazy, I don't know. We find out Lacey decided on bumfuckle because in college she met and fell in love with a farmer named Connor, played by Eric Lively, who is using his newfound knowledge to try to develop a new breed of corn that can grow with less water. This would be quite useful as a construction company recently built a dam that cut off the town's water supply. But because this town is populated by idiots, not everyone is on board with Connor's plan, including his former and apparently current bully Tanner, played by Chad Michael Murray, who ticks off pretty much every redneck stereotype in the book. They tell me you're planning on planting corn this year. Yeah, I was. I plant corn. So does the farming industry run on the rule of dibs, or...? Well, you think you learned something down in that uh, college I don't know about? Sir, on a scale of 1 to 10, how honest of an answer are you looking for? Anyway, Lacey informs her mother that she's far too busy to come home for Christmas this year, so Eileen decides if her daughter won't come to her, she'll go to her daughter. And Medea tags along for reasons that are not entirely clear, but she is unemployed by this point, so it's not like she has anything better to do. This leads to an awkward situation, as Lacey apparently married Connor without telling her mother, as she would not approve of her daughter marrying a white dude. So Lacey has to pretend Connor is just some guy she hired to help take care of the farm. This is like a 90s sitcom. Except it sucks. I don't understand what her endgame is here. You can only keep something like that a secret for so long. Especially if you plan to have kids down the road. If those babies have any white boy tendencies, the ruse is over. The awkwardness is compounded by the presence of Connor's parents, played by Kathy Najimy and... Ugh, Larry the Cable Guy, who know about their marriage and are totally cool with it, but now have to play along with the ruse. And this might have been an interesting angle. The white parents are okay with the interracial marriage, but the black parent is not. Unfortunately, the way they approach this is... not great. Honey, we taught all of our children never see color, only see heart. Yes, and I bet you would have voted for Obama for a third term if you could. Lacey, it's not too late to get an annulment. After a few days of her mother treating Connor and his family like shit, Lacey finally gives up on this incredibly stupid ruse and comes clean, which upsets her mother because apparently her father was killed by a white man when she was young. But Medea then drops a bombshell and reveals that was a lie. The truth is, Lacey's father left her mother for a white woman. You gotta be shitting me. Why didn't you just tell her that? It still explains how you feel about white people. It doesn't involve making up a story about murder. What should happen if Lacey runs into her still very much alive father later in life? How are you going to talk your way out of that one? Does anybody in this family think more than five seconds ahead? And throughout all this mess, we have Medea, whose constant presence is about as enjoyable as eczema. Remember how I said Medea was a garnish in Diary? In a Medea Christmas, she's the main course. And I'm about to call over the waiter and have her sent back. She is so annoying. 
and even going into this without knowing much about the character, it's immediately obvious that Perry is ad-libbing to hell, which drags out even the most pointless scenes. I swear, if everybody stuck to the script, this movie would run under an hour. And it doesn't help that not everyone in the cast has his affinity for improv. Larry and Kathy can kind of hold their own, but poor Anna Maria Horsford is visibly struggling. I know she can do comedy, but improv does not appear to be her forte. And there are a couple of moments where Perry goes so far off the rails that everyone else has to noticeably stop, reset, and get back on script, and it's super awkward. Even Perry himself has to do it at least once, like when Eileen is trying to convince Medea to drive her to Alabama, and she initially refuses until... I'll pay you. What time you all leave? But then Perry realizes that's not how the story goes and quickly makes up something about Medea's car being out of commission because they have to get Lacey's ex-boyfriend Oliver, played by J.R. Lemon, to drive them to Alabama since he factors into the B-plot. Speaking of, everyone in Bongwater is up in arms because they don't have the money to put on their annual Christmas Jubilee. Oh, how tragic. You can't afford to throw a party. Christ, people, get some real problems. Tanner, you know, the asshole farmer, even suggests taking the money out of the school's budget. Oh, great. There's a sensible idea. If we cut back anymore, we'll not be able to finish the school year. I don't care. No education ever did me no good. I want my Christmas Jubilee, god dang it. You know, if Perry is trying to satirize the MAGA crowd, he's doing a pretty good job, but I don't think that's his intention. I think he actually wants these people to be sympathetic, and whoo! Swing and a miss there, Tyler. But it looks like they may get to have their party after all, as Lacey talks to her ex-boyfriend, and he agrees to have his company cough up six figures in sponsorship money, which will fund the party and the school. Really? Some big-ass corporation is willing to throw a hundred grand at a small farming town's Christmas party? I know this dude totally wants to get back together with Lacey, and she's married, so good luck with that jackass, but still, I am not buying that. You know what else I ain't buying? Tanner's son is the bullied kid at school. The other kids are bullying the farm boy in what is clearly a farming town. That's about as believable as the other kids acting. You better hope she comes back. She's the only teacher that likes you here. Girl, your tiny ass school doesn't have more than four teachers. Have a seat. And why is your voice dubbed? You know what else I really ain't buying? The company Oliver works for just happens to be the exact same company that dried up the town by building the aforementioned dam, which somehow nobody realized until after signing the contract. And you know what I really, really ain't buying? They've declared the town can have their Christmas Jubilee, but they have to call it the Holiday Jubilee and cannot include any references to Jesus. Oh, no. She is trying to take Christ out of Christmas. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. I just did Saving Christmas for the second time. I thought I was done with this nonsense. The war on Christmas is not a thing. No one is trying to take the Christ out of Christmas. No one is trying to stop you from saying Merry Christmas. I said it at the top of this review. And you don't see Antifa drag queens breaking down my door to shove a candy cane up my ass or whatever the f conservatives think is supposed to happen when someone says Merry Christmas. There is no war on Christmas, Tyler Perry, you stupid, stupid bastard. <sighs> Moving on. All of these plots eventually wrap up when Eileen just happens to come across Tanner after he has somehow flipped his truck and saves his dumbass. This comes right the hell out of nowhere, by the way. You're probably thinking I left out some important details that set this up. No, I didn't. It just happens. And Connor punches Tanner in the face. Whoa, Connor, buddy. I know he kind of deserved it, but you just decked a man who literally almost died. Time and place. But it ultimately leads to the two making peace, so I guess it worked out. And during the Jubilee, which has a sign that clearly says Merry Christmas, which they supposedly were not allowed to say, but no one is stopping them, so thanks for proving my point, Tyler. Lacey announces on behalf of the company that sponsored this Jubilee that they agreed to release some water from the dam so the town can actually keep planting their crops and make an annual donation to the school. The company did not actually agree to this, but I guess they've just been shamed into doing it? Which of course is not going to work. The corporate rep might smile and nod for now just to avoid an angry mob, but they're gonna go back on this later. They're corporate assholes, it's what they do. You think you can shame these people into doing good? They have no shame. This really is a 90s sitcom. And Eileen accepts that her daughter is married to a white dude and racism is over, the end. And we get a rendition of Mary Did You Know from The Farm Boy, who it turns out is a pretty good singer. And still is, from what I hear. So, that's a Medea Christmas.
I can honestly say it met my expectations. But that doesn't mean much. It's really badly written, the acting leaves much to be desired, Medea is annoying as hell, Larry isn't much better, it's yet another movie talking about the non-existent War on Christmas, and it's very obvious that they had an incredibly low budget to work with. I mean, look at these transitions. Could they be any cheaper? The weird thing is, they're not used with every scene change. They are seemingly applied at random throughout the movie. They're not just cheap, they're confusing as well. The movie didn't lose money per se, but after earning about $53 million on a $25 million budget, it was considered a box office disappointment. It also earned six Razzie nominations, but only took home one. Tyler Perry for Worst Actress which is about on par with the jokes in this movie. But while it was pretty terrible, I do have to give Tyler Perry a modicum of credit. Somehow, against all odds, he has created a character that has made a huge impact on popular culture for over two decades. And there aren't many people who can say that. And you can't last that long without a fan base that loves your work. And if you're part of that fan base, you keep doing your thing. I don't get it, but I get it. Well, there we have it. I survived Medea. Heaven and Earth rejoice. And I guess that means next time we shall return to our regularly scheduled bullshit, which means the worst picture of 2015, and that would be- oh. Huh. Well, we might have a problem here. There was another tie that year. One of the two movies was Fantforstic, and I've already covered every Fantastic Four movie, even the unreleased Roger Corman movie, so no new ground to cover there. And the other was Fifty Shades of Grey, which... Been there, done that. I also did Fifty Shades Darker, and I... Okay, I guess I can't put this off any longer. Next time, Fifty Shades Freed. Merry Christmas! Seriously, what is supposed to happen? Charming. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Charming.